Lesson number two, judgment must begin. Judgment must begin. And it's based on a, a number of scriptures that talk about the theme of judgment. I'd like to start by going to Revelation chapter 14 and sort of the... Um, something of the vision statement, you might say, or mission statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is found in the three angels' message of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 14. And uh, I want to look real quick at Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. The hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him. Notice the close connection between the gospel and judgment. Some churches feel that judgment is sort of ominous and negative, and so they are always talking about the gospel, but I find in my Bible that the gospel goes hand in hand with the truth of judgment. What makes the gospel such good news? Does everyone here know the word gospel means good news? You know what makes the good news such good news? The bad news. Now really, what makes the sunshine so nice after it stops raining? It was the rain that makes the contrast of the sunshine so nice. What makes a light such a blessing? Well, if you come out of darkness into His marvelous light, the darkness actually contrasts and makes the light much more wonderful. What makes the gospel such good news? If we were in heaven and we had never fallen, would the good news be good news if we're all already saved through eternity, like unfallen angels? We wouldn't really think of it as good news. We think oh, it's nice to live forever, but what makes the good news good news is being saved from the judgment that is menacing because of our sin. And if people are not saved, they are facing that judgment. It's like it says in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, of how much more severe punishment do you think he will be thought worthy who has rejected the gospel, the good news, and crucified the Son of God afresh? He who... Um, was condemned under Moses, uh, he was punished, of how much more severe punishment will he be thought worthy? And so rejecting the gospel leads to this judgment. John the Baptist, did he tell the good news about the coming Messiah? But what did he say is the bad news? He said he's coming with his fan in his hand to purge the floor with unquenchable fire. And you look at the preaching of Ezekiel, look at the preaching of Isaiah, look at the preaching of virtually any other um, Bible character, they talk about the good news, and what they say makes the good news so good is there's also, there's judgment that's coming. Now, is there only judgment for the lost? No, there's a judgment for the saved, to determine if they're genuinely saved. Doesn't the Bible say all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ? All means all. And so there's some aspect of judgment for everybody. Now, when we talk about the theme judgment, most people, when I say the judgment of God, they picture the grand great white throne judgment and they picture God wearing the equivalent of white judges' robes and God the Father or Son is in their mind sitting at this great marble throne. He's got a bench and a big gavel in his hand and all the world's lined up before him as they come forth all the evidence is there and they're going innocent, guilty, innocent, guilty. And they've got this some variation of this picture in their mind of this big cosmic judgment. Am I right? You've probably had that picture before. You've probably seen paintings that look something like that before. And there is that component. The great white throne judgment that we think of is what happens at the end of the millennium before when the sheep and the goats are separated that's that great white throne judgment. Some everlasting life, well done, good and faithful servant, everlasting destruction, depart from me, cursed. And so there's this separation, this great judgment pronounced then. But there are many facets of judgment along the way. For one thing, 
you may experience the judgment of God in your life. Sometimes it's called the chastening of the Lord. Can you find examples in the Bible where somebody was judged in this life for their sins? I have. Yeah, David, exactly. When David sinned with Bathsheba, there was a judgment that came on him. He didn't die right away, but he experienced the judgment of God. So there's that aspect. Some elements of the judgment may come while you walk the earth. Then there's a judgment that takes place before the resurrection. Follow me. The Bible teaches, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him. He says, My reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. And that's part of our verse here, but I had to jump ahead to it. When he comes, is the Lord dispensing rewards? I want to get this real clear. Do you believe it's biblical that when the Lord comes, he already knows who the saved are and who the lost are? So he's giving out salvation to one group and destruction to another group. Does it make sense to you that some aspect of judgment must transpire before he comes if he's pronouncing sentence when he does come? Is that logical? Okay, so there's some aspect of judgment that happens prior to his coming. This is sometimes referred to as the pre-advent judgment. Then there's another element of judgment. <clears throat> During the 1,000 years it says that we live and reign with Christ and the saints are involved in some aspect of judgment during that time. Is that a judgment where we're deciding who's saved and lost? No. By the time you and I get to the new Jerusalem or we get to heaven, the saved and lost is already determined. So what kind of judgment are we involved in? Well, it's not that, I mean, it always sounds kind of uh, almost blasphemous to say we are judging God. But what we're doing is really, it's an evaluation of and an affirming of the judgments of God. Will you have questions if people are not there who you thought should be there? Uh, maybe there are some loved ones that you thought would be there and they're not there. God does not want you to doubt His love because someone you love seems scorned. So during that time, we'll be allowed to look at the books. That's why Jesus said, those things done in secret will be proclaimed from the housetop. That's the time when everything's laid open. Now, of course, except the sins of the saved, they are under the blood. Amen. They have been expunged from the record. So don't worry that once you get to heaven, someone's going to manage to hack into your file from your life and find out what you did, even though you're saved and forgiven, but they are going to have those old files. God says He cast our sins into the depths of the sea. We don't need to worry about that, right? So there's a judgment that takes place some in your life. We all know that. We've been chastened. There's a judgment that takes place prior to the second coming. That could be between your death and the second coming. The, the pre-advent judgment. Sometimes called the investigative judgment. There's a judgment that takes place during the 1,000 years. Then there's the great white throne judgment we just talked about. And then there's the execution of eternal reward. So just to give you kind of the panorama of the different aspects of judgment, I wanted to go through that very quickly. All right, let me get into my lesson here. Judgment must begin, and we have a number of verses on this. I know I have some notes too. There they are, that I wrote, wrote out. All right, um, somebody please find for me Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. And someone please find for me John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 18. Where are the microphones? Andrew has one. Who else has a microphone? Pancho has one. Right, hold up your hands right here, Pancho. Jason's got one of these verses. Which one do you have, Jason? You got Matthew 8. And someone else maybe over here, you can find for me, what did I say? John 3.18. Got a volunteer? I see. Hold your hand up. Hold your hand up if you're willing to read it. All right, go ahead. You first, Jason. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit with the Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a very important truth that not only did they need to hear in the time of Christ, but we need to hear. Some people think that we are judged based upon our genealogy, our Christian DNA. 
Does the Lord save people based on looking through a microscope at what their blood type is? God is no respecter of persons. In the time of Christ, there was a very mistaken yet still popular belief that because the Jews were chosen by God that all you had to do is be Jewish and you had to be saved. No. That's why Jesus said many will come from the east and the west. That's the Gentiles. They'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, the fathers of the Jewish nation. And the children, some of their literal children, are disowned and the foreigners are adopted in. So the basis is not heredity. I've heard people say before, why my family's been in this church for four generations. And it's as though the Lord has to say, oh, well, then we better let all those sins in your life slide because you've got good genealogy. <laughs> it doesn't make a bit of difference. Now, the advantage of being, having Christian heritage is hopefully the teachings have been passed on and the good behavior has been reproduced. That's good then. If you've got that kind of heritage where you've, through example and through teaching, you've got this heritage and you're following the faith of your fathers, great. There's an advantage then to being a Jew or a church member for many generations. But there's absolutely no value in being able to point to your family tree and say, see how long they were all in the church. That's why I can live in the world. Because God's got to save me based on my membership on the books. It's important to be a member of a church. I think that's very important. There are going to be some people lost who they, because they refuse to join the church. But there will not be anybody saved just because they joined the church. Did you get that? There will be some people who may be lost because they refuse to get married to the bride of Christ. But no one is going to be saved solely because their names were on the books. So someone, sometimes, we got some people who haven't come to church here for years. And every now and then we call them up to try to encourage them to transfer wherever it is they're attending. Or drop their name if they're not practicing and some folks are resistant as though dropping their name is going to determine their eternal destiny having the names on the books does not keep them saved if they're living in the world and it's especially hard on parents who have kids whose names are on the books and the kids are not living the life at all and every now and then a faithful board is going to have to say this person hasn't been here in 10 years they're not living the life it's really dishonest to call them a Seventh-day Adventist Christian if they're not practicing, they should do the thing of integrity and ask that their names be removed or repent and start living right. Correct? But it's hypocrisy. There is no virtue in having your name on the books if you're not living the life. Amen. Isn't that right? Oh, but I'll tell you, when you get to that point, some of the parents, they get their kids there and they think that's like the, it's almost like making it official when you have to deal with the names of the kids. But there's no value, there's no virtue in having the name on the books. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, John 3.18. You thought I forgot about that. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Very good. One of the main criteria in determining uh, forgiveness, exoneration, or condemnation is faith. Go with me to Mark 16. Uh, this is also in our sermon later today, but it, it fits here as well, so it just popped into my mind. Mark 16, and I want you to notice the important role that belief plays. Go into, this is verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. You notice he doesn't say he who is not baptized will be condemned. Be baptized and believe, saved. Do not believe, condemned. You notice he didn't mention baptized a second time. So what's the most important thing, baptism or belief? belief. Baptism is even more, I'm sorry, belief is even more important than baptism. But baptism is important, don't misunderstand. But belief is the main thing. The thief on the cross will be saved and we don't think he was ever baptized. And so, uh, but those who do not believe, what happens to them? condemnation Daniel 12 verse 1 and 2 I got someone handy who has that and at the time time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people 
and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Keep reading. Yeah, read and verse many three. of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Thank you. Michael shall stand up. You know, when a judge is listening to evidence, they usually are seated, because it can take quite a while. When a judge stands up, he is no longer considering evidence. When Michael stands up, that means the judgment is over. And you notice what happens? There's a great time of trouble. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn from the loss. He's no longer pleading. And then it says there's a resurrection. You notice, Michael stands up, then there's a resurrection. So some judgment happens before the resurrection. Did you get that? A pre-advent judgment. And when is the resurrection? The Lord Himself will descend from heaven. The dead in Christ will rise. When the Lord comes, then there's a resurrection. And so here it's given us this sequence. Now, we're going to talk in the next section here a little bit about life or damnation. And um, that's sort of an ominous word, but it is in the Bible. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Uh, and somebody look up for me Matthew 12, verse 37 and Matthew 25, verse 46. Matthew 12, 37 and Matthew 25, 46. Here, I got some... Who would like to help me read? A volunteer? Want to read one of those? Matthew 12, 37. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. All right, here we have a difference between a resurrection for life and a resurrection for evil. What shocks a lot of people, it says those that have done good and those that have done evil, what's it make it sound like? Almost makes it sound like if you're good you go to heaven, if you're bad you go to hell. Notice belief isn't mentioned here. So are we being saved by faith or by works? Is it by being good and evil or by belief? I'll submit that what you believe affects your works. And you determine whether a person's heart is changed by their actions. If a person is saying one thing and doing another, they don't believe. If they really believe, there'll be a different scene. Did Jesus say you'll know them by their belief or you'll know them by their fruits? The fruits in the life tell what's in the heart. Yeah, we'll get to that a little more in just a minute. All right, I asked someone else to read Matthew 12, verse 37. Did we get a, got a hand right here? Matthew 12, 37. Someone else, Matthew 25, 46. Matthew 25, 46. All right, you go ahead first. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You mean we're going to be saved or lost based on our words? You notice what he says before that? Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So your words are telling whether there is faith in the heart, whether the heart has been changed. Everybody saved, everybody who believes, gets a new heart. What is the new covenant? I'll put a new heart within them. Isn't that right? I'll write my law on their heart. When a person has the new heart, is there a change in the life? If there's no change in the life, there's been no change in the heart. I've got a friend who um, could barely get up and walk a few feet without going white and weak, almost fainting. Matter of fact, they did faint. They had a blockage in their heart. Once they had that corrected, all of a sudden their cheeks went rosy. They were able to work and walk and run made all the difference in the world. When they got a new heart, there's a big change in the life. And likewise, when we have the new heart of Christ, um, we have different works circulating through the life. All right, um, Matthew 25, 46. Did I have somebody? Go ahead back there. Got that? Matthew 25, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment by the righteous to eternal life. You notice that uh, there's two different groups here. And this is the final statement on Christ's passage about separating the sheep from the goats. One group, eternal punishment. Now, the wicked who are consumed and receive the second death, 
in the lake of fire. How long does that punishment last? Forever. The punishment is eternal. doesn't mean they're burning forever. It means the punishment is forever. There's no reprieve. When somebody, I just heard somebody got this a little while ago. Don't you think it's strange when somebody gets 32 consecutive life sentences? How many of them do they really serve? One. But they give them 32. Well, the lost get more than that. The lost get eternal. If by some chance a person could take longevity drugs and live through 32 lives, they might get released on good behavior. You with me? But nobody is getting released from the eternal punishment. The wicked are going to be punished, every man according to their works. And that's another point to catch. If everybody burns forever, then how can there be a variation of punishment? Everyone's getting the same sentence. But if people are punished according to their works, there could be a difference of both intensity and duration before they are um, burned up with the second death. The Bible says they are burned up. Okay. Something else I want you to notice in the judgment. <clears throat> when we think about... Oh, i got so much to say. When we think... i got to fit the next three weeks into this one study. <laughs> uh, when we think about um, judgment, we often think that God is going to look at a person standing before them and say, Well, you are a liar. You're lost. Or you are a thief. Or... You are a murderer or, you know, one of these Ten Commandments that they committed some great sin. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, what is it that is the determining criteria in who's saved and lost? Are they the sins of commission or the sins of omission? Now, let me just say this because I remember the first time I heard a pastor explain this. It just, I had never thought of it before. There's a difference between sins of omission and sins of commission. When you commit a sin, that means you have lied, you steal, you rob, you kill, you're committing, you're doing something wrong. Sins of omission is what the church is usually guilty of. It's not that they've done something wrong, they're neglecting to do what's right. You remember what Jesus said to the goats? He said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was in prison or in the hospital, you didn't visit me. It's not that they did anything wrong, it's what they did not do right. And isn't it interesting, the six things that Christ condemns the goats for, um, this is the parable of Matthew 25, it's not that goats are all in trouble, the six things that the Lord condemns these lost people who are compared to goats for, are all sins of omission. Church members are the ones who are generally guilty of the sins of omission. Like the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite walk by the man who fell among thieves. They didn't rob him. They didn't steal from him. They didn't beat him up. They just walked by. The Samaritan, he helps them. And the Lord says to the sheep, because I was hungry and thirsty and, and naked and a stranger in prison, sick, you helped me in my need. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Isn't it interesting in that great judgment it's more the sins of omission that are considered than the sins of commission. When people think about Mary, she's considered a great sinner. She probably committed some great sins. But is she going to be in the kingdom? She also, when converted, did some great things. She's the one who gave the greatest gift. She cared. And that's what Jesus says separates the sheep from the goats, is great love for your fellow man. Anyway, so I thought that was uh, interesting. Judgment begins at the house of God. Someone re read for me 1 Peter 4.17. 1 Peter 4.17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Very good. Thank you, Roy. Judgment begins at the house of God. And that doesn't mean judgment begins at a church building. You are the house of God. So it says judgment begins with the church. Why? Shouldn't we be last? I mean, after all, we're the saved. Um, it's the condemned that should be judged first. No, that's not how it works. 
To whom much is given, much is required, the Bible says. Earlier this week, Stephen had some friends over. Nathan had some friends over. Nathan's younger than Stephen. Uh, there must have been six or seven boys uh, playing around the bachelor house. And uh, <laughs> they can get into a lot of mischief in that age range. So I went out there and I said, Stephen, I said, if there's any trouble, you're responsible. I said, because this is your house. You know what the rules are here. You're the oldest in this oogle of boys and you know better. So I said, you're responsible. Now, how many of you parents agree with that verdict? Wouldn't that make sense? What am I going to do? Hold one of the neighbor kids responsible? Am I going to hold the youngest responsible? It's the one who is the oldest, who understands he is responsible. Now, that's how God works. Those who have been in the church the longest, who have had the greatest opportunity, will be judged the first. Because God is merciful and he wants to give those who have had the least opportunity more time. Doesn't that make sense? Let me read a story in the Bible that helps illustrate this. Ezekiel 9, verse 1. And this is a passage that's often ignored, but really should be studied in connection with the judgment. It's a difficult passage because it sounds a little bit harsh, but um, it's very important. I'm going to read this one, okay? Uh, Ezekiel 9, I'm going to start with verse 1. He's in vision. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying... Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each one with a deadly weapon in his hand, or a destroying weapon. We don't know what these weapons were. Something that angels use. Maybe what the angel used to guard the way to the tree of life, this flaming sword. And suddenly six men, are these men or angels? They're angels. In Acts chapter 2, when Jesus ascends to heaven, says suddenly there were two men standing by them, and later we find out they're angels. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces towards the north, each with his battle axe. It, it doesn't, the, the, the original doesn't know what to call it. This destroying weapon in his hand. Some translations call it a battle axe. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. Now, we're still not sure when it says one man among them if this is now a total of seven. Six that are armed, one is armed with a pen. A writer's inkhorn. And they went in and stood before the bronze altar. Where is the bronze altar? Are we in the city now or are we further in, in the temple? We're in the courtyard of the temple. And the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub. From above the ark, the glory of God had gone up where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man, to the clothed with the linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead. Now, does that sound a little bit like Revelation? When we think a mark on the forehead, if, if I told you someone was coming to church today and he's going to put a mark on our foreheads, how many of you would want that mark? Now, I wanted to see who the Bible scholars are here. The mark in this story that's given out in the church, you want that mark. You realize that everybody in Revelation is marked in the forehead or the hand. All the saved have the seal of God in their forehead. All the lost have the mark of the beast in the forehead or the hand. This mark is a saving mark. By the way, the mark that God put on Cain, was that a good mark or a bad mark? Well, wait a second here. Cain said, everyone's going to kill me. And God said, I'll put a mark on you. You said they don't. Isn't that what he said? So if you're Cain... And you think that everybody's going to kill you and God says, I'm going to put a mark on you so they don't kill you. Would you want that mark? Now we always think, I mean, we're, we're always thinking, who wants a big old barcode in their forehead? I mean, that's what we think of when we think about a mark in the head. But nowhere does it tell us what the mark is as far as a physical external tattoo. It's not that. When God uses the word mark, it's, it's something that's inner. It's in the life. All right, so put a mark on the foreheads. Um... Of the men in the city who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done in it. They are grieved by sin. They are not complacent or indifferent about sin. They are repentant and sorry for sin. They receive the mark of God. To the others, he says in my hearing, these would probably be the other six, go after him through the city and kill. 
Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Judgment must begin. This is what Peter is quoting in the New Testament. He's quoting Ezekiel's vision. Judgment must begin where? At the house of God. In the last days, where does the judgment begin? There's a great shaking among God's people. And only those that have the mark are going to stay in the ranks. Many will be shaken out. Some will be shaken in. Those who have known the message but have not allowed it to sanctify them will be shaken out. There is a, an aspect of judgment that falls upon people in the church. Let's go on here. And then he goes on and he says, uh, Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple, the ancient ones. They began with the youngest and the oldest. Why? They've had the longest opportunity. Isn't that right? To know the truth. That used to relieve me. The longer I live, it troubles me. Now, go with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8. I want to show you a similar parallel passage. John chapter 8. This is a very important story. It's only found in the Gospel of John. And it bothers me that some translations have removed this story. The woman caught in adultery is a definitely inspired story that belongs in the Bible. And uh, some manuscripts left this out for whatever reason. That's too bad. Verse 1, John 8. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning He came again to the temple, and all the people came to Him, and He sat down and taught them. Now where is this happening? It's in the temple. And then the scribes and Pharisees brought to Him a woman caught in the act of adultery, and they set her in the midst. And they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act, in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something to which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. When God writes, it's very significant. Only times in the Bible I know of that the Lord write, wrote anything. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. He wrote on the walls of Babylon, assuming that was the hand of God that wrote. And here Jesus is now writing in the temple. Did God have other writings in the temple that day? God wrote what was in the ark. Right? Of course, when Jesus wrote, there was no ark in the temple at that time. But you get the idea. The other, the main thing that the temple was made to house was the Ark of the Covenant that had the writing, handwriting of God. Time of Christ, the only handwriting was what he wrote on the temple floor. So he begins to write and acts like he doesn't hear him. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin... Let him throw a stone at her first. And he stooped down and he wrote again. What do you think he was writing? I believe he was writing the sins of her accusers. Which is similar to the law. I mean he might have been writing thief. Which is don't steal. He could have been writing adulterer. Don't commit adultery. So it's similar to when God writes the law with his finger right? And they're wanting to judge her. And he says, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even unto the least. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in her midst. The only one who survives the judgment in the temple is the woman that Jesus forgives. The only one who survives the judgment in the house of God is that woman who Christ forgives. They were wanting to judge her. They were there to judge her. Christ judges them, beginning at the elder. Isn't this interesting? Here is a judgment in the house of God. Christ pronounces a sentence and he writes, so it's both verbal and written, condemnation against the hypocrites. The religious leaders, beginning at the eldest, the ancient men, they go out first. And who's left? This woman who was caught in the act, but she's come repentant to the temple. Many think this is the 
first encounter with Mary Magdalene. I'm inclined to believe that, but um, can't prove it. But I can say it because you can't prove me wrong. There's just not enough there. Um, now, there's a verse that I left out uh, I think is important when we're talking about judgment. Somebody go to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Who will read that for me? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. I got a volunteer. Hold your hand up. If you can find Ecclesiastes. Right here. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret things, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Thank you. God will bring every work into judgment. They are judged by what? The works. With every secret thing. Now a lot of people can put on a good display and appear to be religious or righteous to others, but God looks on the secret things. You know what integrity is? Integrity is who you are when nobody else is looking. Our character, I should say. Character is who you are when no one else is looking. Integrity is when you are honest when no one else is looking. That's integrity. No It matter, doesn't matter whether you've got an audience. It doesn't matter whether you'll be caught or not. You know you're living in the sight of a holy God. And so you are consistently honest and righteous in your behavior because you know that God is the first one you want to... Uh, Impressed, so to speak. Every secret thing. Luke 12, verse 3. Who will read that? Luke 12. Got a couple. Here, I don't think you've read anything. Hold your hand up so he can see you. Luke 12, verse 3. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Everything is going to come to light. There will be no secrets at that time. Uh, it's very important for us to remember. And you know, not only is that true. Remember what I said about judgment. Some judgment comes, of course, there will be an ultimate day of reckoning. But some judgment even happens in this life. You ever heard the verse, Be sure that your sin will find you out? There are some people who have gone by for years with a big cover-up, but then the Lord pulls back the covers and... Everything's exposed. And uh, God has a way of getting the, the truth out there. So it's important for us to remember that we're not just living so we can impress others. You know what that is? Hypocrisy. You pray to be seen. You fast to be seen. You give to be seen. You're concerned about what others see. And you don't really care about what God sees. That's hypocrisy. Romans 14 verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now while we're talking about this subject of judgment, probably the most misquoted verse in the Bible is the one that says in Matthew 5, Judge not lest you be judged. What does that mean? Are we ever to judge others? If you see a brother or sister and they're living in sin... It might mean they're shacking up with someone they're not married to. It might mean that there's some addiction in their life they're just not addressing. Are you supposed to just say, well, I shouldn't say anything because I don't want to judge them? And have you ever tried before to talk to somebody about something that needed attention because you love them and you care for their soul? And they say, you're judging me. Thou shalt not judge. Have you ever heard the verse used that way? Is that what Jesus meant? No. Matter of fact, you do have a responsibility, if you care about others, to hold them accountable. That's something every Christian needs to be, or it needs to be in love. But there's a difference between identifying something in someone's life that needs repentance and condemning. So when Jesus says, do not condemn others or you'll be condemned, do not judge others, he's saying, don't be pronouncing sentence on others, you're not God. You can say, look, the Word of God says such and such, and you need to repent, but the ultimate judgment, that belongs to God. Otherwise, you're like the priests who are going to throw stones at Mary. That's condemnation. Uh, but yes, there is a time to approach people and to talk to them. And I think there's probably more examples in the church today of cowardice, 
among members who are afraid to address sins that are obvious than those who are judging each other. I'll say that again because I don't know that it registered. I think that if the church is erring on one side or the other today, we're erring more on the side of cowardice. We're quoting to ourselves that verse, oh, we're not supposed to judge each other. I don't want to get involved. It's not my business. And so nobody holds anybody else accountable for anything. And to some extent, if we don't blow the trumpet, that blood's on our hands. We do have a responsibility to be honest with people. Then, everyone going around judging each other. That's, I don't see that, at least in my experience, being the big problem today. It's still a problem, but that's not the big problem. Almost out of time here. Again, Matthew 12, we're talking about every secret thing. For every idle word that men will speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Not only the words, it says even their thoughts will be made manifest. Now, then the Lord tells us, and this is under the uh, section, His reward is with Him when He comes. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 and 11. Who has that? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 and 11. That's a, I think, Jason, you were first. Go ahead, Pancho, real quick. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuaded men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also, I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. It says, uh, all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, why? That each one might receive the things done in the body according to what he has done. Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations were angry and your wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets. Now wait a second. The time of the dead that they should be judged. Is there a judgment while the dead are still dead? Evidently. Nations are angry. Is life still going on here on earth? And there's a time of judgment come while life still goes on here on earth? You got the sequence here? There is an aspect of judgment. In a future study, we'll talk more about the pre-advent judgment. We don't have a lot of time right now. Uh, you know, in my closing thoughts, when I talk about judgment, it is an important subject. And some of us should tremble when we consider that there will be a day that if our sins are not under the blood and our names are not written in that book of life, that all will stand before Christ and everything will be laid bare. Uh, no veneer, no cover-up. And it's, it, it can be a terrifying thought for people. But I'd like to encourage you to remember, whose judgment seat is it? It's the judgment seat of Christ. Who is the sacrifice that saves us from the judgment? That's Jesus. Who is our defense attorney? Jesus is our defense. By whose word? Jesus said, the word that I speak will judge you in that day. And so, if you know and love Jesus, if you've got this relationship with Jesus, and if you're living for Jesus, you really don't have to fear the judgment because you've got everything working for you. He's the judge. He's the defense attorney. His word ends up being the evidence for the judgment. He says that he is our friend. And so, when we've committed our life to Christ, we don't need to live in fear of the judgment. It's those who do not have that relationship with their defense attorney and their judge and the one who handles the evidence. They've got something to worry about. And so we need to have this personal relationship with Jesus. Amen?